All right. So, uh, welcome to those who are listening to this recording. Um, we're going to start week three's agenda now. So, um, first, I thought we'd just look at the assignments from last week. And um, this list may not be complete, but this is just like a link to each of your guys' web pages um, as they are now. So, I thought I would just click through a few of them. Um, if any of you guys want to say anything, oh, it's like Chris's. You can skip mine because of this. Yeah, that's right. You were having troubles with it. Um, so, France. Ooh. No, doesn't look right. <laughs> it's okay if it doesn't look right. We can uh, we can sort it out. Oh, it looks like the image isn't loading. Maybe something else. Um, oh, okay. Well, and if you guys have any like questions about um, something that didn't work or like Git wasn't working, uh, this is what it. Was. Oh yeah, that looks different. You have some images. Probably just haven't uploaded the images along with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I read into that because yeah. it's in the instructions, but you do have to yeah. do it with the old, like, you have to do the indi in each individual image. So yeah. if I did it, like, excuse you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if, if I did, because I, I was just adding things. Yeah. All right? And then at the end, I added, committed, and... Okay. It should have worked. End. Yeah. Or you can just, like, drag the images into that folder and then do, like, get add minus AM or something. No, this is... So this is a good question because I, I think it it seems like it should work that way but it actually doesn't so the tricky thing is your <laughs> yeah that's what I got Ellie too is the the folder that your the repository lives in you can put other things into the folder that aren't part of the repository in the sense that not all the stuff you put in there will actually get uploaded when you push to github so that's that's the I think that's the instruction I need to add to the assignment um, I, I think what I did was I, I put the instruction to add the style sheet and I thought, like, oh, well, then you just add the rest. Or that was kind of what I had in my mind. Um, but you actually do, in fact, have to add every new file to the repository. Um, so yeah. Um, but it's not a problem. If you, um, like, we're all still kind of learning all this. You know, it's all, there's a lot of new stuff at once. So um, no worries if it's not all there yet. Um, gamma. It's like, any? Any problems you had, um, or? Yeah, because um, I mean, obviously since I have a PC, you know, I couldn't really do like really anything on my computer. And then like the only thing I could really think of like is in class, and it's like one problem that I'm currently like having is um, it's actually using Terminal to actually like, you know, upload anything mm. that I need to do. Um, because like the only way like I really figured like, because I remember like the first week, you know, like I I did make something, but then I realized that it wasn't actually on the page. So I had to actually go into GitHub itself and like, you know, put any kind of, you know, code that was in there that I had to do. So it's like, for some reason, like it didn't necessarily work. And I'm not sure hmm. why. Okay. Well, um, yeah, getting the hang of uploading with Git is like a pretty central part of what, what we'll need to use going forward. So um, let me just point out one thing that may have been easy to miss the first week. So let me pull that up. First week's assignment developer tools. Um, so I'm using a feature in Git called a branch. Um, and there's two, there's actually two branches of this first week's assignment. So the first week's assignment is essentially like all the stuff you need to know about Git. And there's actually much more to know about Git. There's a lot, like tons of reading you could do. And there is like a chapter that I suggested that you guys read as a way to kind of fill in the gaps that aren't in the assignment. So I think between like this and that reading, you should be set. So, um, but with that said, there is this subtlety where if you click on the Windows version, it does try to like. Um, so this is saying you are reading the Windows flavored version. Yeah. So this was something I added after the first week. So I broke it up into multiple pages and I added a Windows ver version. The thing is, I don't actually have Windows available to test on. So I'm, I'm kind of relying on you guys to tell me what doesn't work for you in particular. And there's actually a way to do that here. So here it says switch to the Windows branch. Um, on the Windows version, there's a link that's specifically about, um, so here it says, this is a work in progress. So leave any questions for, or suggestions for improvements, or if, if there's like something that just didn't work for you, um, this is the ticket for it, and um, 
I'll I'll do my best to like figure out what it might be going wrong or like um, try to look things up. Um, I'll probably just Google it, uh, which I suggest you guys try to. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is like the classic solution to any technical problem. You like plug it into Google. If there's a Stack Overflow result in the top, like that's usually a good option. Stack Overflow has like tons of nerdy people like helping each other constantly. They've been doing this for like a decade probably. Um, so there's lots of good information on Stack Overflow. Um, anyway, so this is, um, this is where I'm collecting problems in the Windows version of the assignment. So uh, let me know if you find anything else. And in general, every, um, every Git repository, every GitHub repository, I should say, has an issues section. And it's linked right here as a tab. It's a little bit easy to miss. But if you want to create a new issue that I haven't, you know, a, a problem that I haven't thought of in general, create a new issue totally on any assignment. Just like, this isn't working for me. And I'll get an email and I can, like, help you, like, a, in a threaded format. Um, or, like, a, you know, it's like a, a topic that you can reply to. Other people can discover it. Yeah, so because it's on the repository and everyone else can find it, you know, it's... Grandmother <laughs> wants to know if you're going to Brooklyn J.S. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. <laughs> Sorry, Grant. <laughs> That's funny. So he works from home today, so he didn't get to stop in. But he, he works in the little uh, cubicle environment. That I should probably show you guys. I'll give you a little tour of where I work. Um, anyway, I should probably, I'll log off. <laughs> <laughs> okay, your discussion is about whether hostess is bad enough. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, I'm going to close this down. <laughs> oh, yeah, the cupcake. I was telling you guys about this terrible cupcake. It was like eight years old. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, uh, th so the the issues part of GitHub. This this is just one part of like other like. There's also a wiki that's built into every repository that's like in addition to the code. Um, uh, do I? So I don't know if there's any wiki pages set up yet, but like there's tons that GitHub makes available um, in addition to what we're using it for, which is pretty straightforward. Like here's my code displayed as a web page. Um, it does tons of other things, too. So. All right, I got off on a little bit of a tangent. But um, I got to talk about the Windows flavored version, which I don't think I've emphasized enough. So that's good. Gwinnett. Yeah. No. No. I'm fine. Oh, you're fine. So no problems. Yeah, yeah it looks good. Um, I like the background image. <laughs> I like it a lot. <laughs> Cool. So, um, and if you did want to change this icon here, the yeah, yeah, well, I, just, I mean, you don't and you don't need to put a image. You could even remove this one if you want. No, I like uh, that. Icon. You like that one? Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so this is something that um, GitHub does for each user. You get a random pixel art icon that represents you, um, and uh, they're kind of nice and colorful. I, I like them too. Um, I worked on a website recently uh, for this event called Prism Breakup, which was like this privacy-themed uh, event at iBeam. Um, and we, as, as like the motif in this header graphic, we basically just took all the icons of the participants on GitHub and made a big like um, quilt out of it, basically. It's like the icon quilt. So yeah, I like them too, actually. <laughs> Is there a way to change that image? Because it, it, it grabs a Gravatar image. Is there a way to change that image without it just without changing my Gravatar image? No, it's basically a Gravatar. It just yeah. has to be. Okay. It has to be. And actually, uh, I, I learned this recently that the creator of GitHub is also the creator of Gravatar. Really? So that's probably uh, why. Yeah. Sense, <laughs> so you can't put your own picture on there from something else? It has to be done through Gravatar? It has to, yeah. Oh. oh, no, no. Well, that's... So I should... I, it may sound like um, you can only put that on your web page. You can put images hosted from elsewhere. Or, yeah, you can you can upload an image into the repository. Yeah, so you don't have to use the Gravatar one. Okay. Um, I guess what I should have said is... I was like, how did I get this picture on? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I guess what I meant to say is that GitHub will only show your profile image through Gravatar. Through Gravatar. Yeah. yeah. There's no way to tell GitHub to use a different one. Okay. Oh. Cool. 
so James. Not here. I didn't have blood point. <clears throat> okay. Oops. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> I, you know, I'm just playing with it because we. <laughs> These pages can be very simple. It's not like they don't need anything too fancy. It's not a surprise he says that. It's okay. <laughs> Hers has an image at least. She managed to upload it. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so, any issues or um, problems? Cool. Okay. We got Hello World. <laughs> <laughs> it could be, I should say, um, it's possible that there's something in GitHub that didn't update. We had this problem that you guys probably remember that updates weren't making it onto the public site. Let me see if that's your case. Um, that was a problem that I had with Twitter. Yeah, it looks like that is the case. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would, it's a little bit of a pain, but the, the way we resolved this before is, um, first rename the repository to something else so that you have it in case you need to go back to it and then create a brand new repository and just you know copy the file in start with a new one and it seems like that fixed it for most people that doesn't mean that I have to do it again like everything okay? no I mean you can I would copy paste it yeah so if you click on this this raw button or even edit like you can just uh, you know select all and copy it and that's why I was saying, like, instead of deleting it all together, um, just uh, rename it as, like, you know, your name.github.io, maybe .backup. And then, you know, create another one that doesn't have .backup. And that's the one it will use. Um, oh, well, the code looks, the code looks reasonable, so. <laughs> um, it looks like you don't have any background image or anything, but that's cool. Oh, no. Yeah, there's no uh, CSS. Oh yeah, it could be that you don't have your, all your changes up, but cool. cool. Nice background, Max. I like the hearts. <laughs> no, it has a chef's hat too, a teapot, cool. a happy face, a martini. Wow, a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. <laughs> no, I like that. It's a good background. Where did you find the background? Google. Just Google. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Um, any issues or problems? No? Cool. Let's see. Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah. Randolph's also not here. Wow. You got the custom fonts. Nice. Yeah. Uh, I remember what you said about the Google fonts, so I just wanted to. Cool. Yeah. What, what is this one called? It's open. Yeah. Open Sans. Um, I use this yeah. for all my stuff. <laughs> it looks nice. It does. Yeah. Yeah. The nice thing about Open Sans is it's also like open license. So there's no, like, oh. like you don't have to worry about having to pay the font oh, gotcha. company. Yeah. Um, cool. Any issues or anything? Yeah. Cool. And did I skip over Aaron? I guess I haven't linked to it yet. Do you have yours? Yeah. Um, okay, cool. So let me, maybe I'll just add that now. Um, so this is the, the WordPress backend for our site. Um, let me, oops, folder. And what is your? Design. That's right. And we reload this. Should show up. There we go. Oh, that's right. I remember this. Oh, wow. <laughs> Over the top. This is great. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I remember the picture. <laughs> I saw it. <laughs> Nice. I think PHP is a little bit like boxing. <laughs> it's a yeah. Like I, each each language has its own kind of cultural like way of doing things. I would say you know Ruby is a very elegant language and it lets you be very like 
you know, I'm, I'm very uh, pristine with my code, except I wanted to like, I want to expand it to do more stuff. Mm -hmm. um, Ruby lets you like add lots of stuff into the language itself. PHP is not, it's like messy. It's uh, you, you just hack everything together and you hope that it works. Mm -hmm. um, but it's usually, you know, you can write elegant code in that, in that context. Um, you can be a, a, like a, um, you know, you can impose standards on yourself that make PHP a good language. And Python is similar to Ruby. It's even more strict about the syntax though. Like you can't expand like how it works the same way. Ruby lets you extend the native like elements of the language, which I don't think Python lets you do that. Um, anyway, so. So Rasmus Murdoch rewrote PHP from like the personal homepage days and made an entire different library from it or something like that. Who, who did? Uh, Rasmus Murdoch. Oh, yeah, yeah. He basically, yeah, invented it, right? He's like a Yahoo guy, I think. Wow. Rasmus something or other. Um, yeah, Rasmus Murdoch. Murdoch, yeah. Um, I looked at some, yeah, I was looking at like talks that I could show you guys. I think his name came up, um, but I didn't. Yeah, we're going to look at a different guy, um, Douglas Crockford, who didn't invent JavaScript, but he's like uh, one of the um, the few people who have written books that everyone reads. So, um, yeah, Rasmus is, is, is on that list in general, too. Did I miss anyone's site? Uh, I think maybe that was everyone's. Um, so uh, I think we're off to a good start. We're, um, you know, we're in week three and we haven't really started talking about JavaScript yet. Uh, but I think the, I think really knowing CSS and HTML is probably more important than JavaScript really. So I, I wanted to make sure that we, you know, put a, a foundation in place uh, so that we're all kind of on the same page. And also GitHub, like GitHub is um, increasingly like how people are like sharing code and, um, learning how to code, like if you can explore GitHub and find other people's projects and learn from them, like that's that's a huge benefit. Um, so yeah, uh, I think I think we're doing well, uh, and I'm gonna forge ahead um, with my first lecture about coding. So we're gonna learn to programming using a browser. Uh, when I learned to program, I had like a Commodore 64. It was a funky <coughs> machine that, like, <laughs> yeah, no, really. I learned to program on Commodore 64. It. I don't know if you guys know this one. It's like, uh, it oh plugs into a television, and like you could. <laughs> it's like from the Revenge of the Nerds, right? <laughs> yeah. it's, Commodore 64. it's from that era. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that's it. Couldn't do very much, but it was really exciting when I could get it to do like really simple things. Right. Um, yeah. So JavaScript, I think, is like the the language that I learned on is called Basic. There, there's like Visual Basic now, and like you could probably find ways of programming Basic, but nobody nobody really uses it anymore. Um, but that didn't matter. Like I think learning to program is something that you can learn in any language, and once you learn your first language, it's so much easier to get to the next one. Um, and a lot of people are doing. JavaScript stuff. So I think it's a really good language to learn on, actually. So I'm going to talk a little bit about like why we would even want to learn to program. Like, What's the point of all this? Um, so this is a, a quote I was going to start with. Uh, when human beings acquire language, we learn not just how to listen, but how to speak. When we gain literacy, we learn not just how to read, but how to write. And as we move into an increasingly digital reality, we must learn not just to ha how to use programs, but how to how to make them, how to write the code. Um, and that's that's one of the reasons you should learn how to program. It's just like being able to speak. You know, it's a basic um, aspect of using a computer. This is from a book um, by my old uh, graduate school professor Douglas Rushkoff. It's a pretty good book. I would recommend it. Um, it's a it's a good book. I won't say pretty good. I won't modify that. <laughs> um, another quote, uh, this is a different guy from an earlier era. The single most significant change in the politics of cyberspace is the coming age of this simple idea. The code is law. <coughs> the architectures of cyberspace are as important as the law in defining and defeating the liberties of the net. Um, and this is from a lawyer, Lawrence Lessig. He came up with, um, I actually thought this was a different quote, not from an earlier era. This is from like probably 99 or 2000 or something. Um, 
there's a version of this book that's like in wiki format that he invited people to come and make edits to. Um, I think it's code V2 or something. Um, I think the original book might be more coherent though, like uh, has a single author. Uh, I think this idea that, you know, how, how software we use is written, like that defines a big part of how society works. Like the fact that we all have a Facebook account, probably, maybe not all of us, but that the the way that code was written actually influences how we behave and like how we vote and how you know how we go about our daily lives. So I think um, that's another reason to do it. Another reason is just like why not? Because you can like why not jack up your you know Camaro or whatever that is. <laughs> <laughs> it might be fun, um, you know, and like write your own code. Like fuck them in, you know. Yeah. We don't need Facebook. We'll write our own Facebook. <laughs> this is from an album cover, uh, The Prodigy. Um, I forget which album it was, but uh, I just think it's funny because he's cutting the wrong side of the <laughs> rope. <laughs> that is not going to make the bridge fall. <laughs> <laughs> but it's otherwise a pretty fun image. Okay, so we are learning a new language. It's just like spoken language in a lot of ways, but it's text. So it's only a written, no one speaks code, basically. That would be silly. Um, so it's basically a lot of typing. Um, it's very careful typing. That's what programming really is. Um, and if you can do it fast, you'll go a lot, you know, you'll, you'll learn a lot faster. Like if you can, like, I, I really mean this, like if you can teach yourselves to type faster, like the whole process will go a lot better. Um, yeah, question, right. France. So I keep asking like the guys at my job, like, how did you learn how to type? Like, you know how to type? Because everybody's just like, doing this and I'm, you know, yeah. pretty fast with two <laughs> fingers. But I, I was thinking that same thing. I mean, do I need to know how to type to write better? It code? really helps. Learning to touch type, like so, not relying on just two fingers. I think that'll go a long way. Um, so, I think so. I, I mean, I think the the problem there's not a problem with do, use, just using two fingers. Although obviously, more fingers the faster. But the problem is that like, usually you're probably looking down. Like you should be looking at the screen no, while you're doing it. And, that, and that's the case. So I try to yeah. do it. So if there was like a, you know, some like I like guess sublime. Sublime they text. Have kind of yeah. like a spell check. You know what I mean? So sometimes I look up and just try to teach myself how to type because I, I remember where something is. And if I spell it wrong, I know that it'll spell check it on there for me anyway. And like, I'm going to auto correct it for me. But it's probably not. Yeah. Way to go. I would turn off that stuff. I would rely on the accuracy of your. So I think the accuracy of like getting your fingers to know how to type things without having to think about each keystroke, like that's the thing that'll get you to. To really like accelerate your programming. So what I mean is like um, when you're confronted with a situation where you can copy and paste something versus like type it all out, just type it all out because you might do it wrong and you might learn something about like oh I, I tend to type this thing in place of that thing. Um, so I think yeah like I don't know. Well, it's, is that it's like hard. simple as like well maybe that's it's not simple but like let's do those would a person have to take a class, a typing class? Or no, man, it's simple. Look, open your, your laptop really quick. <laughs> simple. You see yeah. this? Oh, you're missing. <laughs> you're, you're missing. <laughs> you're missing. <laughs> it's there. It works. But you see, you see how the J has like yeah. this little bump? And well, for you, you're missing uh, the yeah, F. Yeah. So, you know, you don't have to look at it. You, you feel that, and then that's where your fingers are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, from there, you just have to learn where the letters are, and then you're typing. Like, and if you get lost, you just find a little bump. Or, or you're missing key, and and that's it, you know? I, it can be helpful to practice, though. I it, mean, yeah, I yeah. learn because you wanted to, but, like, I practiced. No, I practiced, like, too. something that we practiced in, like, seventh grade. Yeah. When I, yeah. You know, and so you, there were programs you could practice, but you can also just set up a book and, like, type from that and, yeah. see how, and look at the book and not look at your screen, you know? Just, like, practice. Yeah. The, yeah. Way, yeah. the way I had to learn was kind of funny, but it worked. Uh, we had the keyboard, but then they made these boards... So that even if we did look them, we, you couldn't look oh, at the wow. keyboard at all. That's a good idea. So yeah. you're like mental, like so you're not mentally stuck. You had to like memorize where the. You could probably put a cereal box of your keyboard or something. I don't yeah. know. Like yeah, I would totally a do that. Little, yeah, 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 it was a little wooden board. Yeah. So you couldn't see anything. I like that idea. Yeah. But even like I feel like. You just got Big old hands on the keyboard. They do, you know, you might want to get an external keyboard because I've, um, I don't know. I, I don't mind. I, I've gotten to the point where I can use any keyboard, but like, it may, you may find that like getting a different keyboard may change. Yeah, because I was always, I always wondered that. If like yeah. the way I type has something to do with how I'm writing code or like. 
Well, well, how fast, like, well, not just how fast you can write it, but. Well, also you have you to. You be writing fast, shitty code, like you know what I mean. It's that's well, yeah. You have to do that, and then you write better code. You know, I write fast, shitty code. That's like seriously. I, I, the code I write isn't perfect the first time. It never is. But if you do it fast enough, you know, it's like. You just have to learn how to feel the keyboard as comfortable as you can. Because my dad has that problem, so he has like really fat fingers. Like his hands are huge, so he has to like kind of maneuver his hand around the keyboard in order for him to type, and he types fast. So, like, not only do you need to learn how to type, but you have to feel comfortable with the keyboard that you use. I, uh, I learned with a game that, like, uh, I mean, there's tons of games, and I think... There's an app for it. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. The, the thing is, that learning with an app, if you mean, like, on a phone, like, you're no. not going to... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean... Maybe, maybe you can get... <laughs> the two yeah. <laughs> there you go. I know, it's true. Oh, my God, only two fingers. I mean, you might <laughs> learn... Like this, you just put it in your laptop and then you practice. What? There's, it's a what? There's Which game? Is yeah. I was like, maybe it's Beacon? Yeah. I remember that one. I regret that. It's a joking class. I didn't do it. Another way is like people would read you and you would have to like listen to the words and then I would have to be like, da 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 Yeah. I learned on this black and white one that was like really old school, but it was fun because like you had a little runner character and like he jumped over the hurdles. So it was like. It was kind of like has a physical metaphor, and like if you mistype something, he'd like trip over trip. a hurdle. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. That's, that was that was good for me. I think like a Mario version of that. Yeah, I'm sure there's better ones least. too. There's probably websites that do this really well. Right. Yeah. I also use that Cypher Shark. A question for me. The whole game. It's worth it. It's worth learning to type fast, and not just for programming. Like you can type papers faster. You can, yeah, you can do your taxes online faster. It's great. <laughs> Brought to you by. <laughs> Okay. So, but I mean, like I was saying, you know, typing fast just gets you to the failure point faster. Because I, like I'm saying, like debugging is coding. Like that's like seeing what didn't work and like why it didn't work. That's that's really the essence of programming, I think. And I tweeted something like this: "It's long stretches of hopeless confusion punctuated by flashes of comprehension, followed by lots of typing." So you sit there, you don't know why it's not working, and then like you suddenly realize it, and you just type in the solution. That's, this is programming. Tweet size, this is the whole class right here <laughs> in a tweet. So programming in general, um, text files, we're comfortable with text files by now. Um, and pro so running a program, like, you know, setting up a web page is a little bit different than running a program in JavaScript. Running a program in JavaScript is like, it's, it's a set of instructions that ex get executed one at a time. Um, is that the next bullet point? No. So what's happening though, which also happens in HTML, is the computer is sort of parsing the stuff you've typed into the file, and it's digesting it. So like the browser is turning it into um, some kind of page that gets rendered to the screen, um, and it's filtering all the way down to like there's like a hardware controller on my laptop, like a physical thing that's actually moving the pixels to make the page. Um, so like I'm programming the computer when I make a web page. You know, it's not. Some people will say like it's not real programming. It's a, you know, PHP is a scripting language. I've heard that one. Um, it's all programming. HTML is programming. CSS is programming. I think like setting the time on your microwave is programming. Like all of it is programming. Um, and it's just you know different levels of complexity, and it's all just like ultimately you know you're running like instructions that a chip knows how to perform. That's ultimately what we're doing. And writing code in a text file format just happens to be more convenient. Um, so that's, in general, every programming language is the same this way. Um, and the kind of programming we're doing, this is uh, where there's like a set of instructions line by line, like JavaScript. Um, a line of code is kind of the basic unit of, of you know, if you wanted to break it down, like lines of code are how you would talk about it. Um, so, and that's why a lot of like text editors, let's see if I can uh, pull up my text editor, um, if I can open up a recent file. So like notice there's all these numbers on the side, like the line number of the code like lets you track down problems often. So you'll see like in Firebug when, when I have a JavaScript problem, it'll tell me wh exactly which line the, um, the problem occurred on. 
And then I can go back to my code and say, like, oh, this line of code was the culprit. Um, Doesn't it do it in uh, JEdit also? Yeah, this is JEdit. No, no, I'm not like, oh, double, like, hey, it's oh. going to be part of like, I see. So, like, catching those yeah. errors. It can. I don't. I think so. Mine says like seven errors down here. I think yeah. it always says that though. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. I don't use that. <laughs> I mean, it could actually have seven errors. Sometimes there'll be like red squiggly lines. Um, I don't know. I don't like the way JEdit does that, but I think you can set it up to do it. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to this. Um, so sometimes a line isn't actually like an actual just single line of code, like. For readability, sometimes it makes sense to split things into multiple lines. So, like, actually, this is a good example of this file. Um, this is kind of a single line of code, even though this you know starts at line 60, ends at line 66. You know, it's technically six lines of code, but um, I wrote it this way instead of like this is another way you could write the same line of code. Um, but like you wouldn't want to write it this way because you can't see the end of the line because it's too far. So, so yeah. Uh, okay. Is that is that what that minify stuff does? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of code, especially JavaScript, will get minified, and this is a process where it'll like rename the variables so that they're shorter and like it, and take all the line breaks out, and so like all the variables have like a, b, c, you know, just like the shortest possible. Uh, length, um, and you can see this like any. See, they probably have some minified code here. Um, here's some minified CSS. So this is, you know, a CSS file basically, but it's all just on one page. Um, and the reasons are just like it it loads faster essentially. Oh, that's the reason. That's the only reason to do it. It's like this file size would be you know 20 kilobytes normally, and then like. Because of all like ten kilobytes compressed, yeah, it just makes the page load faster. So you would always minify it. I don't your... think I minified everything here. Um, yeah, I don't. I mean, minifying stuff. I think at a place like our magazine website, we get so much traffic that minifying a few files could actually save us a lot of money in hosting costs because we get charged by bandwidth. Maybe I don't actually know how it works, but that's usually the reason. And it does make the page load. You know, marginally faster. Um, yeah, we won't. I we don't need to know about minifying for now, though. I think um, I don't know. It's one of those optimizations. It's like a minified JavaScript file versus like a JPEG, which is you know ten or twenty times bigger in file size. I don't know. It seems like kind of a rounding error in some ways. But. So yes, uh, but a lot of what minifying does is it's takes those lines that have been split onto multiple lines for readability and you know puts them all on a single line because the computer doesn't care like the computer executes it all the same it, you know the the spacing is for us to be able to decipher it and maintain it better so let's write our first line of code in JavaScript um, and we don't even need firebug to do this there's two ways you can run this this is the hello world. So hello world is the program you always do first. It's just like you get like whatever language it is to spit out the text hello world. So we're going to do that. You can actually just type in JavaScript colon in the address bar. This is like um, whatever you type after this will get executed. This is what a, um, a bookmarklet essentially is. It's a, a URL that is really code that you can run on a page. So alert hello. I think it should work in other browsers. Let me make sure it does work. Oh, shit. <laughs> it didn't work. Uh, let me do it on this page. Huh. What does the error console say? Alert is not defined. Well, that was a bad demo. <laughs> uh, can I do other things? Maybe console.log. Nope. Console is not defined. OK. Well, so much for that. Um, so what was what, were you, what was that supposed to do? That was supposed oh, to... I'll show you here. So, yeah, I was gonna show a pop up. Um, can't you do it? Yeah, like that. Yeah, so you can do it in Firebug, uh, typing in the line of code. So this is hello world. Uh, it it's just a an alert message. Yeah. Can you try it on a different browser? Maybe? Uh, sure. We'll see if Safari will do it. Yeah, maybe browsers don't do this anymore. I, there's been like some, 
I, I I've read some things recently about like security like limitations uh, so that someone's bookmarklet doesn't like mess with the page. Maybe I don't know. I don't know what the logic is. Um, but let's see. So there's a Google Translate bookmarklet that. Oh, I don't know. I don't know what this is doing. I think it's just telling it to go to some other web page. Um, but if we were to let's see, edit bookmarks. Um, here's oh, here's the read later one. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, why isn't bookmarklets here? Anyway, so I got off on a tangent. I'm going to go back here and continue on. So uh, we're gonna look at this in more detail, or we just tried it in Firebug. Um, I guess that comes later. Okay, so this is the thing to know about computers. They're just gonna follow whatever instructions you give them, and they're not gonna like get your nuance, or they're not gonna care if you like ask nicely. They're just gonna execute the lines exactly how you type them out. So there's this like classic um, exercise that a lot of people do on the first day of a computer science class, which is like, tell me how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Like, write out the instructions on a piece of paper. And I've done this in class before. I won't do it here, but I, I'll actually have like some bread and some peanut butter and some jelly and a knife. <laughs> and I'll follow like some of the instructions and I'll pretend to be a computer. And you know, every time someone forgets to like open the bag before you get the bread and like, so I have to like mash my hands through the plastic and it's like a big mess or like, I don't know, I forgot to un, you know, unscrew the cap. It's all this, all this stuff that you forget about. And like, that's the way programming computers is. You have to like give every single line, um, every single detail that it needs. So it's not cutting you any slack and every program you're gonna write will probably have bugs in it. Like even my hello world example had like a bug, it didn't work. Um, so even at the very smallest level, like there's bugs that can creep into a program. Um, but like one thing that was helpful when I did that in the, the JavaScript console, it did give me an error message. So I was able to like figure out that like in, in this context, like when I'm trying to run code here, it doesn't know what alert means. It says alert is not defined. Like that's a pretty good clue about like what I can do and not do in, in that context. And the same, you know, on a web page, like you'll see these kinds of errors. And a, a big part of programming is learning how to read it and how to, like, apply what it's telling you back to the code. Like, what should I try to fix? Um, so yeah, that's debugging is is really like getting good at debugging is like really how you learn to program, basically. Um, so like, here's some examples of how I might do the hello world. Um, example poorly like here I forgot to put the closing parenthesis and it's actually giving us a pretty good um, error message it's telling us exactly what's missing um, this one I forgot to put a quote mark the error is not as helpful <laughs> um, you kind of have to know what a string literal means for this to make sense string literal is is the part in the quotes that's that's what a string literal is we'll talk about like data types I don't think today maybe today later though um, here I put an extra parenthesis, and again, not a very helpful error message. So, you know, it's, uh, it, but one thing that I, I could read into this, it's saying missing semicolon before statement. What it's actually saying is like, the problem is you wrote a, a parenthesis instead of a semicolon. Like, it's it wants there to be a semicolon at the end of every line. Um, and it's kind of optional, like, you don't have to write JavaScript that's, where the line is terminated by a, by a semicolon, but you should. And often an error message will say something like this. You forgot your semicolon. Um, so notice here, I, I added the semicolon. That's just a way to tell the JavaScript interpreter, this line of code is done. Like, here's the end of it. And that's, that's really what the semicolon means. It's like, end of line, go to the next line of code. Um, so here we're like, we're calling a function called alert. And the way that works is you put the function name you want to call. Um, the parentheses are the part that actually call the function. This syntax is pretty common, actually. This, this is how PHP does it, it's how Java does it. Most languages, you call functions this way with parentheses. The only um, odd one out is, I think, like, what Python, Python does have it. It's Objective-C. Objective-C uses square brackets. It looks really weird to me. 
but that's the uh, apples. Yeah, that's that's what iOS apps are written in is Objective C. Um, but it's I mean the ideas are the same. So like once once you get past the like the look of it, it it works the same. So yeah. Um, and then this is called a function argument, and we don't have to dwell on what these things are called or um, exactly what that means, but you can kind of guess, like I'm, I'm passing the message that I want it to alert out. That's, that's kind of how this function works. You, you give it some text, and that text is what gets put in the alert message that, that I see. So, And then the, the semicolon, that's important. That just tells the computer, we're done with this line of code. Um, this is the end here. So variables, this is, um, this is an important topic. This is how uh, this is how you store data in a computer. It's kind of like a box. So you take data and you put it into a box. And I have some animated GIFs that will help illustrate this. <laughs> We're putting a cat into a box. So if the box is our variable, like it now has the value of cat. Cat's in the box. So now that's the value. If you were to check <laughs> what's in the box, it's the cat. cat? That's not my cat. Our cat looks like that, but that's not it. I totally just missed what's going on. I <laughs> <laughs> this, is a, this is stretching the metaphor a little bit. I'm just talking about how a variable is like a box that you put data into. So in this case, the variable is the box. The value of, of this variable is, is the cat, basically. But the idea is like... Um, there's two things going on. There's like there's the container, there's the sort of thing that you name a variable, and then there's the actual mm -hmm. value of it. And it's 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 a hard idea to wrap your head around if you haven't done some programming. But this is kind of the equivalent. I'm I'm stretching the metaphor thin on the last step, but essentially the first step is saying like take this named thing called box and put a string called cat in it. Assign this value. Like save this for later. Um, and then later, if we wanted to like alert that message out, like if we wanted to use the value of the whatever is stored in the box, then it'll remember it. So we can try this. And this is like the the second most simple program we can do. So I'll say var message equals hello world. You guys probably can't see that, huh? Let me let me zoom in. the parenthesis. Oops. There we go. Yes. Actually. I didn't want the first parenthesis. Um, so this is this is our first line of code. I'm a little bit too zoomed in here. Let me zoom out. So um, we have now we have a uh, a variable called message, and if I type just message, um, it'll give me back what its current value is, and it's the string hello world. I just assigned it like that. Um, so if I wanted to do our alert like example, I could just type it in this way, but I could also do it this way. I could say take the value of message and make that the thing that we alert. And again, hello world. So it's this is the two line, or I guess I did it in three lines, but it is kind of the two line version of hello world. It's slightly more complex. Um, and notice when I was typing message, um, it started to auto-complete it. Uh, so the, like Firebug knows that I've defined this variable. And so it's trying to be helpful and say like, you have something called message here, like, hit tab to auto-complete it. So if I hit tab here, you know, it's going to use that. Um, there's a bunch of things that are preset, like alert. This is something the browser has built in, but there's tons of other things. Like the, the window is the, the biggest level object that contains everything else. So I can say window, and it gives me this thing called window. I don't know why it says students there, but if I click on it, this thing has a bunch of stuff in it. Like there's information about what browser I'm running, um, it says that I'm running Firefox, that it's this particular version, there's all these functions, um, it goes on and on. Uh, there's other things like, so like I could say window.inner width, and that, so that's the exact width of this window. It could do the same for height. Um, there's lots of, uh, so this is like, I guess, just this, this measurement here from the visible part of the page. Um, for those of you who can't see that, it's only 385 pixels tall by 1024. Um, so the idea is that there's variables that I didn't even have to set. Like th This is something that the browser has done for me ahead of time, just by loading the page up. It's like, here's a window object, and it has these, uh, these variables set about the height and width. And if you just know the names of them, you can find that stuff out. I could try setting 
inner width. Let me see what happens there. Will it actually shrink the page? I actually don't know. Um, no, it didn't shrink the page. <laughs> and what happens if I ask for the width again? Will it have taken hold? Nope. So this, this variable happens to be kind of magical. I can't control it. It's something that the browser has control over. Like it actually corresponds to the actual width. Um, Let's see, so going back to presentation. Okay, so um, the first two lines were kind of the hello world example. The last line, this is when I'm removing the cat from the box as it were. This is a way you can like make a variable not have a value anymore. You just set it to the value null. Null is kind of like a, a special empty value in JavaScript. JavaScript is a little bit weird. I'm only going to mention this in passing because it, it's one of the things that people complain about JavaScript, actually. JavaScript has more than one empty value. Um, I could have used quotes with nothing inside of it. I could have used uh, the, the term undefined rather than null. Um, I could have set it to zero. And those all are kind of like ways of setting it to an empty value. Um, and the reason people complain about this is because each of those has slightly different implications and not everyone agrees what you should use. Um, languages like Python are a lot more straightforward. They're, there's one way to do it and there's the best way to do it and that's the way you'll do it. JavaScript is totally the opposite. Java, JavaScript's a little more like PHP this way. There's lots of ways to do it. Um, it's a little messy, um, but so lots like, of people use it. It's like yeah. a weak, a weak a script? Or weak, You've weak probably, type? yeah, weakly typed is, uh, is another part that people complain about, and it's a little bit related. So typing has to do with like, um, let me, this is, this is going to be a weird example. If you're not, um, if you haven't seen this before, like, this is kind of weird. So like, there's a way to say like, something, like, I'll actually use the string something equals something. And it will tell me, do these two things equal each other? Um, so I hit return, those two things are true. Like these things are the same. Um, and I could say something else or, you know, just add something. Now those are not equal anymore. Um, I could say something like this. I could say zero equals zero. That's true. Yes, those are, those are the same. If I put it in quotes, it is true. This is where weekly typing comes into play. Well, because... Yeah. <laughs> Because that is zero is nothing, but that zero is like in quotes, so it's like a string. In most languages, the it does zero equal zero. In strongly typed languages like Java, Python, I think Ruby also, they'll say false. Those two yeah. things, no, I think, no, Ruby would say false too, I think. I don't know. Um, so typing, weakly typed um, is a way of saying like the browser kind of tries to help you. It thinks you meant the number zero, even though you wrote the string zero. So a string zero is, I, this is a little, I, I don't know. It's hard to explain this, except to say there's ways of like asking more particularly. If you add another equal sign, you say, I only that, want things that are the same type. I, yeah. Okay. And there's, there's also this. You can say, what is the type of the capital O? Or, yeah. All right, I guess I need to put it in friends. So that's a number. This is a string. Um, you could say, like, give me the number version of zero. No, I guess that didn't work. <laughs> so type coercion is a way that you can kind of ask for things in a different type. So a string is one type, a number is another type in JavaScript. Null is a type. Um, Boolean. Boolean, it's like true or false. Um, these are all different types of values you can put in a variable. Um, and there's not that many. There's only, like five or six, I think, in JavaScript. Function, object. Um, there's a lot of predefined objects. So like if I do, oh, so this type coercion thing, I think the correct way to do it is actually um, parse int like that. So this is how you would turn it into a, the number zero. Um, so like there's like math.random is kind of a fun one to use. Every time you call it, you get back a different random number. Um, and this, so this is a, an object that's built in. There's also math.py. You can get pi to a pretty high degree of accuracy. Um, these are all just things that are built into math as an object. So if I if I just type math in Firebug, I can click on this 
and what is it saying? No properties. Okay, well, <laughs> I think because it's like a, a browser built-in thing, it's not letting me. I don't actually know why I can't look at that, but I could say math.random without the parentheses. So this is, uh, like, normally if I wanted to call this, I'd put parentheses like this. If I remove them, it's just telling me this is a function called random. Um, if I say, what is the type of math.random? Um, oh, I keep doing it without parentheses. I don't know why I do that. So that's that's a type function. Um, getting distracted again a little bit, but typing is is an important part of variables. So it's I, I don't think I had slides for that, so it's it's good it came up. Um, because because JavaScript has this thing called type coercion and it's loosely typed, it it actually makes it a lot easier when you're starting out. It it's not very it's very accommodating in that way. Um, the downside is it can't detect when you've when you have subtle errors in your code, whereas Java can. Java can say, like, you were going to pass uh, a number back at this point, but you actually gave me a string, and that's going to cause problems later. Um, JavaScript isn't good at, like, giving you a heads up for those things. So there's there's trade-offs. Um, and actually, uh, there, there actually is a way to tell JavaScript to behave more strictly in this way. So um, more modern versions of JavaScript aren't as bad in this way. So variables, the cat in the box. Um, it's just a way to s store some amount of data for a future. Um, it could be like the, the string like I was doing. It could be like a whole function that you want to execute later. Um, and we'll go into functions more later. Um, but the, the main point is that each variable, it's it's got a name. Like I had one called message at one point. Um, you, could, you could name variables different things. But the name has an associated value, and that can change. Like you can put different values into a variable. Like I could set message to hello world, and then later on I could set it to, you know, the same message in another language. Or I could like, I don't know. I I could set it to null, and it wouldn't have any value. So that's that's what variables are. They vary. You know, that's like the whole idea. Um, in in the example, you know, box was the name of the variable. Cat was the string. Um, so name here on the left, value on the right. Oh, so I do have a slide about data types. Um, so JavaScript is loosely typed, so it's kind of like automatic transmission, I guess, is one way to think about it. I, I prefer stick shift on a car, um, but I actually like loosely typed languages. I don't know what the deal is with that. <laughs> uh, so it's easier, but you have less control over it. You can like drink your coffee and drive, but um, you know you don't have control over when it's going to shift gears. Um, so we're, we're just sticking to some basic types today, like numbers, strings, and objects. We've looked at objects a little bit already with the math object. Um, so, um, but going back to like basic logic with, with variables, um, and you guys have an idea, what, what is the value of z in this, this little sequence? If I was going to run this code, at the end of it, what would z be set to? Was it seven? Five. 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 We got five. We got seven. Um, let's see. So I mean, sometimes it helps to actually diagram it out. We have these three variables. The first line we put the value three into x. Um, we take that value and we add one. In the second step, um, and then yeah, five is the is the last step. Um, and sometimes like writing out these things is helpful. You know, like what is I, I do this sometimes with like complicated visual stuff. Like if I'm like, when I was doing my um, I was talking about those animated charts and stuff like that stuff gets complicated and like writing out what each variable is can be helpful. So I don't know. This is this is a very simple example, but um, going to paper and pencil is is totally helpful sometimes. So we're we're actually running JavaScript within this web page context. You can run JavaScript in other contexts, like uh, for example, Node.js. This came up earlier. You can run that in like a server environment. You could run JavaScript in After Effects. Like a lot of really mm -hmm. sophisticated yeah, visuals uh, are based on JavaScript. Photoshop, Photoshop has it too. <laughs> like doing scripts, like instead of doing the actions, you can use JavaScript to like. Yeah, do I was learning this a little bit at one point. It was I think it was called Extend Script maybe, and it was pretty cool. Like you could, um, it, I was using it in in uh, InDesign to like create new 
like sections and then each section I was pulling in content from a file or something. So you can actually do some cool stuff in Adobe products with JavaScript. Um, I don't think I'm going to cover that in part because I don't know how to do it well. Um, but I could, if, if this was something a lot of you wanted to know, since EDM is a little bit like graphic design oriented, um, we could make that part of the later stuff in the, in the class. Um, that's kind of like the, the opposite of the web-based stuff. Um, but, you know, I work at a print-based place, so I'm down with print too. Um, <laughs> I do like good print materials. And I like design, so I, I, could, I could be convinced. Um, in the web context, the document object model is like, it's kind of like uh, a typographic grid system. If you have covered this in like, um, in a typography class, like a grid system is a really good way to like break down how a layout works. The DOM is kind of the equivalent in a web page context for JavaScript. So the DOM is like essentially how you interact with HTML content. And also you can set CSS, you can basically affect any part of the page. So, I mean, you've seen this, you've used web pages that, that make use of this. Like, uh, and the way they do it is through the DOM ultimately, uh, the document object model. Um, so you can find stuff, you can change stuff, you can wait till someone clicks on something or moves their mouse in a certain way or touches the screen. Um, so basically it's just a, a set of functions built into JavaScript when it's loaded onto a page. So the browser provides this thing called the DOM for you. Um, and one of those things like is, uh, let, me, let me just do a quick example, like the document top level thing um, has a lot of these things like uh, it's auto-completing one of them as create element. Like that's a way you could create new stuff on the page. Um, when I did, you know, this autocomplete dot thing, like we can actually look at a lot of these different things. A lot of these are um, DOM methods. I don't know how a lot of these work actually. You don't need to use all of them. Um, but one that, uh, what is it, get element by ID. This is like a pretty standard one to to start out with. Um, so I can, I think there might be uh, an HTML element with the ID content, maybe? Let's see, so I hit enter. No, there is not. <laughs> Let me try another one, main. I'm just thinking of what I might have used in the code. No, that's not there either. <laughs> Let's see what I have that has an ID. So section dash classes. So this is a, an HTML element and it has that ID. That, so that's what this uh, get element by ID thing is about. So let me just hit the up arrow so I can get the last thing I did and I'll just paste that in there. Um, so I'm gonna ask for which element on the page has this particular ID and there we go. Now we have a link to this part of the, the console. So the, the JavaScript console actually works with the HTML tab. If you wanted to find something, you can log it to the the JavaScript console and then you can use it to inspect it over here. Um, and we can do it other things like we could say like dot, uh, I don't know, styles or style singular background equals green and set the page to be green. Um, you know, this, this happens uh, live. Like, so the commands that we're writing here in the console, um, these actually affect the page as we're viewing it. Um, that's, so that's kind of the essence of the DOM is like, this page here, you can, you can change it, yeah. So get element by ID is a function? Yes, yeah. So that's a, and it's a predefined function, and it's something that just kind of exists on the page. And we're gonna look later, I think next week, at functions that you write yourself. Um, so you can create new functions that have different names. You, you can choose whatever name you want for a function. Um, but yeah, I won't go too much into that right now. But um, yeah, these are functions that you call, and the usual, the way you can tell is like whenever there's a parenthesis like this, that's that's a function usually. Um, and the way you know an object, I should say, is whenever you see a dot like this. So document this top level thing. If I just type that in, um, that's that's all. That's an object. So an object is uh, a collection of bundled up functions and values. It's, it's basically a way of representing some part of memory. In this case, it's the, the whole page's document. I mean, it's, it's what it sounds like. It's an object 
in memory that represents the whole page. So like document.title is a variable that represents like the this title up in the um, the top of the page. So if I say I, this one, I think you can actually set. I can do another hello world example. So now that it's also the tab, I guess document.title is used for that. Um, and the document itself, if I said like type of document, it's going to tell us it's a document. Okay, I thought I was going to say object, object. but <laughs> it's uh, it's messing with me. So does this change in uh, you're using the console on fire bug, mm -hmm. right? Um, how come you're not using the DOM? Tab. Oh, the DOM tab. That's a good question. Um, why am I not using the DOM tab? If if I click on this, then it goes over here, I guess. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think so. This this tab is, I guess, a way to inspect parts of an object in memory. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't have named that tab DOM, but I might have named it like uh, variables or something. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> it's a good question though. Um, another question is, uh, is it actually changing the page, or, or is just like the Firebug changing it, you know, pseudo changing it? <laughs> it's pseudo, yeah, pseudo changing it, um, in the sense that if, if someone else was to load the page, they wouldn't see the green. Um, right. But so here's the thing that most people don't realize about web pages is when you load a web page, you're seeing something that's in your computer's memory. You're not seeing something that's on the server. What happened is like the server sent you a copy of it, and then it's you know it's kind of like playing a CD. If you scratch the CD, it, it you know not everyone's is gonna break, but um, but a lot of people don't realize this. It's not like their web page. It's it's a page that's running in your memory on your hardware. So in a sense, like your it's your code. Uh, I this is this is how I justified some projects I did where I would actually change the web page using a plugin, like so that other people could modify the page and. This was a project I was working on, and I would always tell people like it's in your computer's memory, so it's your web page. You know, they had a copy of it that's the original, but you know, you get to run it in the way you want to. You can turn the background green if you want. Right. So anything that precedes that dot is the uh, is an object. Yeah. So we, right. The, the dot. Anything after that is what's in the object. Yeah. So I mean, an object is. Um, it's just a bundle of other things, and some of the things could be other objects. So, like you could do document dot. What's another object in here? Uh, body is like the the body of the HTML essentially, and this has a bunch of other stuff after the dot. Um, and I might even say like uh, first child. So this is like the the first thing in the page, um, and that's just like the. It looks like it's a, a line break is the first thing. And I can say, what's the uh, text content of that first child? So I, it, there's nothing there, but it, yeah. So objects can be nested very deeply in JavaScript in, in any language. Um, so each of these things uh, between the dots, this is an object that contains this other object, which in turn contains another object. So. Could you skip the like? Let's say could you skip body and just say document that first child. Uh, let's try that. I don't know. Uh, I don't. It might. <laughs> so first child, yeah. So first child is gonna be the HTML element. It looks like so where it says name equals HTML. Um, that kind of makes sense. That's like the very top level. It includes it includes both the body and the head. Right. And if I said what's the first child of that, I would guess. The first child of yeah, nothing. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why it did that, but um, you can also say like child nodes, which is um, a list of all the. It's like we're gonna get into arrays later, which is what this is, um, and it looks like it's empty. I don't know. I don't think they want us to use this. <laughs> uh, yeah. Anyway, there's better ways to find stuff than using uh, first child, but and especially when we get to jQuery. A lot of this DOM stuff, you you won't actually need to ever know. So I'm I'm exposing you guys to it as a way of saying like this is what's happening under the hood. But jQuery actually um, it it abstracts all this stuff. It makes it a lot easier to use. It makes your code a lot smaller. Like you don't have to type as much stuff out. Um, it's I learned before there was jQuery, so I had to learn this stuff. In fact, they hadn't really not all the browsers 
even implemented the DOM correctly. So, you know, it used to be worse, way worse. Like you'd have to write a page for Netscape and you'd write a page for IE and they worked really differently. <laughs> and at least now we have like a common way of working with pages. Um, and we have libraries and we have things called polyfills, which take the crappy browsers and make them like fills in the gaps with like um, equivalent code. Things are a lot better. So just on a practical level, this is what this is how JavaScript gets put on the page. It's a lot like CSS. So you know, instead of style, this it's called script. And just like with uh, CSS, there's a way to include external .js files. And this is regarded as like a better way to do it in most cases. Inline JavaScript is is okay in a lot of cases. Sometimes you have to use it that way, but it's usually better to to put it in a separate file. So um, yeah, and in terms of like where you would put this in your document, it should always go after all the content um, as kind of the last thing in the body of the HTML. But how come sometimes they put it in the head? Yeah. That used to be the place they said to do it. And now it's they say it's better to put it in the body. <laughs> it's probably calling the stuff before the page is loaded already. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Sometimes but sometimes you like... want it to do that. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, it's a, I mean... I think I think a, a big reason for it is that browsers, uh, I don't actually have a good answer to this question. I kind of just do it. Um, but you're right that sometimes you can put it in the head. Uh, maybe you have a yeah, good reason. Yeah, as they mm -hmm. say, like sometimes when I put a head and then do some work, and then I put it after the, um, the, the contents, like each contents below the contents. Yeah, right. I would that. So basically, uh, the, the tricky thing is, as the page is loading in, like, a page doesn't just load instantly. Like, it's it's gonna sometimes need to load an image, and sometimes there's very complicated things to render out. So you know, a page can load like we can actually see how long this page took to load in you know a matter of seconds sometimes. Um, this one, you know, you can kind of track the first thing that it loaded took a full like what was that? Almost half a second. Um, this little pop-up is a little annoying, but if we go to the very bottom, it's saying it took 978 milliseconds, which is nearly a second. So that's just a fairly slow page load. And JavaScript is executing potentially at any point in this whole process. So, you know, it could run as soon as this first, what this is saying here is that there's a, um, and this is the HTML of the page, um, the very first thing it loaded. And that just means like it's downloaded the file for the HTML, and it hasn't started rendering it necessarily. Um, and as it's rendering it, some things are available in memory and some things aren't. And you could run JavaScript before, like if you wanted to change the thing to be green background before the thing loaded, um, that's going to cause an error. And so that's why I say put it at the bottom. Um, the advantage to putting it inline, like, uh, like Gwinnett was saying, like in like as the page is loading in, um, is you you can potentially get things to be interactive before that end state. So like maybe the top has loaded in, but the bottom is still going. Like I could by putting the inline script, I could say like this thing is is ready to go. So add all the like interactive -y stuff on it. But I'm not instruct. I'm saying put it at the bottom. It's it's simpler. <laughs> <laughs> Or you can just do it on the external page. What's that? Like an like a external um, JS page. Yeah, yeah. But sometimes like you you have the script page, and then you have to load loading, loading the script. You have to put it in HTML file, right? There, yeah, there's a trade-off to putting it. Um, there's certain conditions where I would put it in line on a page like this. Do I have one that's... No, I have all in line, but... One advantage is you don't have to set up another request for a file, which can add some time. And the other thing is browsers typically can only load two files at a time. So like if you have a really slow image that's loading in, and then you start loading a JavaScript file, that means that like whatever was coming next is waiting, you know, for that JavaScript to finish. Yeah. So I mean, there's these are optimizations that I think I I think get obsessed over way too much by people who who write front end stuff. Um, I, there's there's a time to to do those optimizations for sure, but it's not like it's not the first thing you should think of. It's it's usually like 
how, what's the slowest thing on this page and how do I make that faster? And sometimes that is the JavaScript and sometimes it makes sense to do these kinds of things. But often it's like, I have this ad thing that is like really on terrible hosting and it's just like taking forever to respond. That's the, the thing to optimize. But anyway, or remove the ad. <laughs> That's what I wish we could do. Just remove all the ads. Our pages would load so much faster. Um, Can we do that? Uh, I, if there was ever a, a way, well, there's ad block. I mean, you get, right. if you, <laughs> But I'm not supposed to advocate for that because that's, uh, See, that's how you get that pays my check. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. Um, yeah, I mean, you can you can block ads and you'll notice the page loads a lot faster. But there's there's sites that can detect that and like I know Ars Technica is it's another online it's magazine site. Like, uh, yeah. I mean, right, there's a there's an ethical reason not to block ads. I don't know. I'm I'm a kind of indifferent to it. I don't have an ad blocker in my my own uh, browser, but yeah. Anyway, so uh, this is this is kind of what I was showing earlier, um, where I'm I'm finding an element called foo, which is I keep wanting to point to something with. I mean, I'm gonna stop and see if I can make. Uh, Show the pointer. That's what I wanted. Okay. So this, because this has the ID foo, that's what it's going to find here. Um, there's two paragraphs here. It's, it's not going to get the first, it's not going to get the second one as a different ID. Um, what this code will do is take the value of this variable called color um, and set the background to that color, which I think is yellow. So this would basically highlight the text in, in this first paragraph. Um, this is another example. Um, it's instead of setting the background color, it's using something called inner HTML, which says like take take the insides of this paragraph and replace it with this new content. And this can be like HTML. It can have you know other paragraph tags in it. Actually, you shouldn't do that because paragraphs inside of paragraphs that doesn't validate. But you could put like a uh, bold or italics. You can use HTML with inner HTML. Um, there's another one called outer HTML, which lets you set like the paragraph itself. So I, you know, I'm getting this this bar um, HTML, and if I set outer HTML, I could say like this paragraph thing has a different ID. Like I could set the container as well as the stuff inside. Um, but inner HTML only handles the stuff between the tags, basically. Um, I think stri strictly speaking. Inner HTML is not part of the DOM, but I think basically all the browsers support it, so you can you can use it. It's kind of a pseudo standard, I think. Um, okay, so this is we're introducing a new thing here um, that's similar to alert, but lets you type something in. Um, you know, I uh, I think that probably the best way to do this is just to demonstrate it. I'm just going to copy this. Uh, I could do it in the console. Um, I'll, I'll just make a whole new page actually. It's, I think it's simpler that way. So I'll save this to my desktop. Um, I'll just call it uh, color.html and open this in Firebug. Actually, I have a new tab. And there it is color.html. So um, page loaded up. The first thing it did was it asked me what color to set the background to. Um, and I don't know, I'm going to use that FF9, which is yellow. Um, and that's that's what it's setting it to. So let me reload the page again. And instead, I'll just say red. And it actually, you know, red is a predefined color you can use. Um, let's see, fuchsia, is that? I mean, it's probably misspelled it. I don't know how to spell colors. <laughs> there we go, magenta, yeah. You get the idea. So um, basically, this prompt is, you know, it's like the alert where it's, it's asking me a question, but then I can type something in. And then it's storing that in, in this variable called color and assigning that to, to this um, style thing. Oh, so that style is like a CSS kind of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and if I. So if I go here and I, I can actually say, like, what is foo? 
Um, so foo is this variable, it's, and it's still here for me to use. Um, so I can say, like, uh, let me zoom in again. If I say foo.style, um, this gives me a, an object that represents all the CSS properties, and there, there's many of them. Um, if, I, if I scroll through all these, it'll be a whole bunch. So these are potentially like things that we could set. Here's one that we did set, which is, oh, this is something else. This is CSS text. Um, this probably is like the all of the styles that have been set on this thing. Um, I didn't actually know this exists. That's kind of cool. Um, what was it? CSS text? Uh, text. 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 Yeah. I mean, that's a little bit too zoomed in, but um, so essentially, like some of these are are familiar. Like color is the the color of the text. Um, I think background is probably up here. I think I scrolled right past it. This is the one thing we did set, uh, the background color. Um, but there's tons. Like, see, There's so many things in CSS you can set. Um, I could probably find a few that I've never heard of. Um, this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this one is like, uh, I, I recognize this from like Illustrator. You know, the line will either have a rounded edge or it'll be squared off or... Yeah, I don't know. I I doubt many browsers beyond Firefox. No, I don't know. Maybe yeah. others do. No, oh, ID doesn't do round the corners. Right? Yeah. Let me let me try setting that. I don't know. Yeah, IE doesn't. IE doesn't do most things. <laughs> it sucks. Uh, so let me set. I think if I set a border equals um, one pixel, uh, I'll make it five pixel uh, dotted pink. So that's that's a well, it's kind of a bad example. But let me <laughs> yeah, let me do solid pink. There we go. And then I'll try setting. What an ugly example this turned out to be. <laughs> I don't know which values are good here, but um, I'll try rounded. Nah, round. I could look this one up, but uh, I'm just guessing at what it might, what its values might be. Um, I don't even think this is a CSS thing, maybe? I don't know. Yeah, it looks like it's an SVG thing. Um, I don't know. <laughs> uh, weird. So anyway, I guess that doesn't actually do anything. Um, that, for another list of CSS, you can use, I, it's actually in the HTML tab, but if you go to um, computed, uh, why isn't that coming up? I click on this one maybe there we go so if I click on this paragraph um, it's it's a little bit more compressed it, it only shows you I think things that have been overridden maybe uh, although you can ask it to show uh, yeah so I guess this first option is like show me everything I think by default it shows just those properties that have been set um, which I think is actually a good default um, yeah, and again, like you can use this tab to like turn off different things that have been set or to modify them. Um, so essentially, what what we're doing in JavaScript over here is is a lot like what we've been doing in Firebug already by you know tweaking things on the page. Um, right. Okay. I think we're almost done with this presentation. Uh, okay. So this is the same example, but instead of changing the background color, I'm changing the content. Um, Maybe I'll just modify this slightly. So what text, and then I'll say inner HTML equals text. Oh, good catch. Yeah, so it shouldn't have this style there. So it's very similar, um, but it should let us set the, the text of foo instead. Let's type something in, and there we go. This is a bad idea. You should never do this. Um, <laughs> and the reason is this is this is where you mix content and code. So, like by by inserting some HTML here, uh, by letting the user insert HTML, like you could trick someone, or you know, an attacker could trick someone into putting dangerous code in there. Um, the classic example is you put uh, a one by one pixel image. So like you make an HTML call that whose source attribute points to a, an attack server. And so you can load uh, content, or you can actually make a request to that attack server. Um, 
and in that request you include things like what's the user's cookie and by by knowing the cookie you can actually take over their their session so you can like pretend to be someone's facebook session like if if you've ever heard of someone's uh you know website or their facebook getting hacked yeah, a lot of times yeah. yeah it's this kind of thing where content didn't get escaped properly you know they're taking uh, something that came from a URL usually and putting it onto the page. It's called cross-site scripting and it, It's not something you have to worry about too much yet, but um, It's it's good to know that it exists. It's like one of two or three um, Security things that are really good to know from the beginning. It's it's one of these uh, problems that Like almost every web application has to be like carefully scrutinized. Does this have any cross-site scripting potential? Um, and this is basically what I'm doing here. This is like an illustration of like uh, the worst way to do it. Like this is this is a bad cross-site scripting <laughs> attack. Um, let's see. So, oh, that was the last slide. So let's see what's on the agenda next. Um, any questions about all that? We covered a lot. Um, luckily, that's, that's, yeah. um, that's recorded though, right? Yeah, Just so it's all recorded. I hope. Uh, <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it would suck if it wasn't. You just, sometimes I have like a little recorder to, to use as a backup, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> um, the slides are online. Yeah, the slides are online too, so you can go through them. Okay. Let me go back here. See, <laughs> my green background is annoying. Uh, so I think the next thing I wanted to show you guys is a video um, by this guy, Doug Crockford. Um, and then I was going to show a couple things. Um, including like how to validate your HTML. So validation is like a, a way to f like, catch mistakes um, if you forgot to close something or whatever. There's lots of ways that um, a validation can, can help you out. And then I was going to show what our next assignment will be this uh, coming week. Um, but I think it's probably a good time to take a break. I could use a break. Um, let's come back at 8.45 and we're, we're actually running out of time, but um, yeah. I don't know. We may not watch the video. I don't know. Maybe we'll do that for homework. Unless you guys really want to watch the video. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll play the video. You can decide to not watch it. It's it's here to watch later. It's linked, so um, that'll be our uh, our compromise. So unless we like bring popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> Very clear that. Um, I think there might be a way for me to play through the speakers. Actually, I'm gonna stop this.